appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you today and I appreciate the, certainly the opportunity I've had to represent the 14th district now for the last three years. It's been an honor and uh, I realize it's something that every morning I get up and, and fight for the people of the 14th district and then for our state and for our country because it's an important uh, obligation to make sure that what we continue to do, I don't want to say make America great again, but certainly keep America on a path where we continue to forge forward no matter, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to lie, I didn't vote for his president twice, but certainly uh, I think it's important that we continue to, to have conservative policies that dictate how our country is being led and, and how our money is being spent. And I take my seat on the Appropriations Committee very seriously in making sure that we're getting the maximum bang for our dollars. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here again uh, on this beautiful almost spring day. So uh, I actually agree with Congressman Joyce. Um, I think it's important to have somebody in Congress that will fight for conservative values, particularly if he's a Republican. Unfortunately, Congressman Joyce has not done so. Uh, he has routinely collapsed with the Republican Party leadership to give the president and the Democrats uh, everything they wanted, including most recently on the omnibus bill. Uh, and that is a, is a great disappointment, not only to me, but the people of the 14th District. You know, I was in, in Washington three years ago, just after Dave got appointed, and I saw him in his office and I said, Dave, what are we gonna do about President Obama and his abuse of executive authority? And he said, yeah, we gotta do something about it. Unfortunately, uh, Dave's a, a, an acolyte of John Boehner uh, who didn't do anything about it. And so here we are now faced with a Republican base in revolt that wants to send someone to Washington that actually believes in these conservative values, and that's what Matt Lynch is gonna do. Uh, Representative Joyce, you've been a, a very strong advocate of Lake Erie issues, something mm -hmm. we've been, we've praised you very much on. Where would you uh, evaluate that uh, standing in the current Congress, and why is it that um, despite, you know, the concerted efforts of the Ohio delegation, we still uh, don't have, you know, the kind of action that we would like to see, either on the uh, stopping the CARP, uh, and also on the um, Cuyahoga County River Dredge issue. Thank you for the question because it's something that's near and dear to me. And I'm proud of the fact that uh, the uh, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative just made it out of committee uh, last week. Hope to get it to the floor soon and hope to get it passed. So we'll establish level funding for the five years to, to be able to make sure that we continue to protect and preserve the Great Lakes. One of the things I've tried to change the conversation from being the, just a, a lake or a series of lakes or Great Lakes to a national treasure, because that's truly what it is. We only have one chance to do this right. And so people don't appreciate the, the fact that, uh, of how important these things are until you have issues like what took place in Toledo a, a couple years ago or what's taking place in Flint right now. We don't have a redundant potable water supply. Uh, and so it's important that we take care of that first and foremost. And then there's a certain amount of economics that's that, that, we get a lot of bang for our buck out of the Great Lakes, not just on providing the water supply, but a number of jobs that are created through shipping or processing the, uh, the water or making sure that we have uh, the availability to continue to work on the Great Lakes uh, restoration initiative. Those are jobs in and of itself to continue to do it. It's very important uh, also that we uh, make sure we do something about the CARP. And, and you know, I'm not an expert, but it, it's wrong to me that Glimmerist, uh, you know, from the Army Corps of Engineers, took them seven years to do, and they came up with eight different options, one being do nothing. So seven options. And not being an engineer, I don't care which one, but pick one. And let's get behind it. And let's fight it. Because uh, every time we, we find this eDNA getting closer and closer to the uh, to our Great Lakes borders, you risk the tack of getting it in there. And as we know, great uh, certainly Lake Erie gets decimated by it when you get these invasive species in there. And I certainly appreciate uh, Chris was always a, a big proponent of that, and, and he'd call, and, and uh, you'd have to talk him down for a little bit. Wait, we're, we're, we're all moving in the right direction. But the thing I'm most proud about is the fact we have tremendous bipartisan support. And it's something that people work together, and, and uh, Rick Nolan from Minnesota just the other day in committee you know, was thanking me and saying that how uh, I'm the Great Lakes guy, and I, I, I don't mind wearing that title because I do think it's important. And lastly, you know, inside this room I say this, I won't say this in, that much in public, but the fact is, it's also a national security interest. And when you have this crazy things we have going on in, uh, throughout the world, and that dirty bombs inside the Great Lakes create and would wreak havoc on our ability to continue to provide a potable water supply 
and it would wreak havoc on, on a lot of other things as well. So if we can get it clarified that it is a national treasure, that it has national security interest, then we can also get dollars to it to make sure we have a defense system in place to make sure that doesn't occur. Um, Matt Lynch, you don't um, mention Great Lakes issues in your position papers, um, but would you continue if, if you were to be elected the, the bipartisanship position? Yeah, certainly. In, in fact, the, the reason that I don't mention it specifically on my website is because it's really not a matter of controversy, right? There's really no disagreement that the Great Lakes is a national treasure. Uh, the, 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 that's why there'd be bar, bipartisan support. Um, why Congressman Joyce has failed to be able to get it passed is a, a mystery to me, uh, other than his handlers that run the Republican Party just haven't given it the green light. It's as simple as that. Um, if, if the leadership of the Republican-led Congress, I mean, we control the Congress. We control the Senate. Yeah, if we wanted to pass Great Lakes legislation, it would be passed. Uh, the problem we have is that the leadership of the Republican Party uh, makes its own choices, uh, sometimes separated from what the people in the district want, certainly, uh, which is why you need to send someone to Washington who's actually going to fight for those values and not simply wait in line and hope that at some point you get the nod from the Speaker of the House or, or some other part of the party. Um, you know, as you know from my history, that's not, not what I do. Uh, I fight for what's right under all circumstances, and I don't wait for approval from the higher-ups. And sometimes that means you have to take on your own party. You, uh, on your... Can, can I, oh, sure. Go ahead. It's galling to me that you bring something like this up. We paid, we've had the down payment on that now, $300 million a year that have worked through the system and had tremendous bipartisan support for the GLRI bill that we're working for is to have level funding for five years. It isn't one of the most effective uh, cooperatives that we have among all the different uh, agencies that have jurisdiction over the Great Lakes. And we work together to uh, sole purpose, protect and preserve. And that's important. I mean, we don't have the EPA, well, I'm in charge, or you know, the Army Corps, I'm in charge. We get a little bit of that. But we also have to apply muscle that's assertive on them to say, stop. This isn't a game. We have to act in concert to make sure we do what we're supposed to do. And so that's where you drive your energies instead of waging war on whatever the, the, the bill du jour is that he would like to talk about or fighting uh, the uh, powers that be. I mean, we lost a, a, a tremendous asset for Ohio in John Boehner. John Boehner was a good speaker for Ohio. Right now, the, the, the biggest uh, chairman we have is uh, Steve Shabbat on a small business. Committee. And, and while that's a big that's a big chairmanship, and, and it should be, you don't realize how big the power up of the speaker was, and especially in being helpful to the Great Lakes until you lose it. Let me ask something that's going to be an undercurrent, I think, in all the questions here. You, sure. you, you seem very, you, you seem like a hardline guy. You're, that, that I'm going to go in. I have principles that I'll fight I'm for. I'm going to get what I, what I want, but, but we have very little movement in Washington because of people who say, I'm going to get it my way, or we're not going to get it. We'll shut down the government. And, and that spirit of negotiation that existed when Ronald Reagan was president doesn't seem to exist. And, and you're involved in this standstill where, where nothing gets done. And, and so in every question we ask, we're going to be encountering this. You can talk tough, and, and you're there, but nothing nothing changes. So, so how does that attitude of, Work mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. when there's when you lose the give and take. I mean, it seems like you're you're take there's standstill now, and your position seems like it's even more hardline than many of the people who are there now. Um, yeah, well, it's interesting that you would say that because it's I don't actually agree that nothing's gotten done. Obama's gotten everything done that he wanted. He got Obamacare funded. He got he got Planned Parenthood funded. He, he, he broke the, the budget with the omnibus bill, over $100 billion of new deficit spending. He increased domestic spending. He's, 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 he's destroying the military. So Obama's getting a lot done. The question I ask is, why isn't the Republican Party leadership in the House and in the Senate actually stopping that from being done? I, I, I wish it were true. I would rather have nothing done than get all the bad things done. And from the conservatives' perspective, we have really given Obama much of what he wanted. So uh, it's this, it's this uh, sort of bipartisanship, can't we all get along? Well, what the Republican Party leadership, along with Congressman Joyce, what they believe is to get along is that you give the other side half of everything they want. And they call that compromise. That's not compromise, that's capitulation. And that's why the Freedom Caucus exists in Congress, and Jim Jordan leads that Freedom Caucus in, in order to fight for conservative principles. I'll be joining that, that Freedom Caucus. Of course, Congressman Joyce uh, has never been part of the Freedom Caucus because he's just not really an honest conservative. And as a result, 
when we, when we have that kind of leadership in Congress, we will get things done, but we'll get things done uh, according to the conservative agenda and the Republican Party's agenda rather than the left and Obama or Hillary or whomever. Well, he's right, I'm not in the Freedom Caucus. And Freedom Caucus is a uh, by invite group <coughs> that Jim Jordan leads. There's, I get, there used to be 40 members, I think some have quit. Uh, you know, but the substance of it is that uh, they, they, they sit around and if 80% of them agree that they're going to take a position, then all of them have to vote that way or you get thrown out of it. I got news for you, the Freedom Caucus doesn't own my voting card. Na a conservative Review doesn't own my voting card. Heritage doesn't own my voting card. The good people of the 14th District own my voting card. The good people of the state of Ohio and our country and what's in their best interest, I'll vote for day in, day out. You make a, uh, you know, a lot of noise about you wouldn't do this, you wouldn't do that. But you know, you didn't get a hell of a lot accomplished when you were in the state legislature, and, and most of what you got accomplished as a Bainbridge Township trustee was deficit spending. So it was the, the fact that you want to talk about yourself being a true conservative, that's sort of interesting. But uh, I look at being conservative, that we've actually cut spending in the federal government the three years that I've been there, cut spending. And you know, granted, we have to get our national debt under control. It's, it's what, $289 billion we're going to spend this year just in interest on that, on that debt. That's more than we're spending on education, transportation, and commerce. I mean, that, that, that's crazy that we're spending that kind of money just on debt. So it's very important for us that we continue to do what's necessary to reduce spending. It's also very important, and, and I was guilty of this too, saying if we get back to the Senate, we could get so much more accomplished. And, and it was a little lesson in government for me that less than a, a veto-proof Senate doesn't really produce a, a lot. But so you have to make work with the other side, and you have to make deals. And yeah, I did work with them, on, and I did support omnibus. You know, there's bills that I supported because it's important that we keep the government and keep the country functioning. I think where the people get uh, their frustration, or they see the most of it. And I, one morning I was working out, and Bernie Sanders was uh, uh, on the, the screen, so you know I listened because he couldn't change it. But it, it was one of those things. It, he does a tremendous job of, of defining voter angst. You know why we overpromise and underdeliver. When you say you're going to shut down the government and you're going to shut down Obamacare, that's that's just wrong. You're lying, to people. You know, and, and I've had these people come up to me saying, you know, you got to vote to sh uh, defund Obamacare or shut down Obamacare. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do that. But do you understand it's built into the law? And do you understand that it has self-funding mechanisms and that it's going to perpetuate? So we can vote to defund it, which I have done every time I've had the opportunity. But it doesn't stop the law from being. Uh, uh, taking from the law from uh, taking place and taking part of our economy. The, another part I did not agree with our president on is he continued to waive different parts of this. And now he's waived things past when he's leaving office. So we've never felt the full impact of the law. And uh, you know, I was crazy enough, and Boehner told me to shut up about it. I said, and I'm not a litigious sort, even though I was a prosecutor for 25 years. That sometimes you got to sue. There's nothing in the law that gave the, the president the ability to make those waivers. And when we sued, we won. And that's what we have to do. That's why you have three parts of government. You have a legislative, you have executive, and, and when there's a problem, there's a disagreement between two, you sue, and it goes to the judiciary and let them make the call. That's working with people, that's working together, and that's trying to move our country forward. Did you want to respond? Sure. Uh, you know, so much there, but, uh, you know, truth is important, and, and transparency is important. So Dave says he cut spending. Well, he voted for the omnibus bill that had $100 billion plus in new deficit spending. He says it's, oh, he's not uh, controlled by uh, this group or that group. Those are all the conservative groups that rate uh, congressmen and senators as to what their, their values are and their votes are. And Dave Joyce gets an F from every single one, conservative review, heritage, uh, freedom works. They all give Dave Joyce an F. He says he's a conservative, but he, he votes like a liberal Democrat. I'll tell you who he's in the pocket of. He's in the pocket of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that spent over $300,000 on his reelection campaign last time. And it's running ads for him right now. And what's their number one issue? Illegal cheap labor in the United States, amnesty. Uh, and when you get that kind of money, that kind of support from those groups, believe me, you're in the pocket of somebody. You know, and he says he, he, he argues against Jim Jordan and the Freedom Caucus. You know, you cannot call yourself a conservative and then turn on the very people that actually ousted John Boehner. And yet he, he, he phrases John Boehner. The truth is, that the Republican Party base is fed up with this kind of duplicity, this kind of dishonesty, that people say one thing when they're running for office and then they do something else when they get there. 
And, you know, I just got to put this Bainbridge Township thing to rest. He's running ads saying, oh, I'm a big spender in Bainbridge Township. You know, I have a chart here we're going to leave with you guys that shows the spending in Bainbridge Township and their recurring, and their recurring expenditures the entire time I was there. Went down every single year. Well, in 2011, now, 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 let me, in let me 2011 just, let me you just, moved for a budget that was $1.65 okay, million, let, and it was actually, you only took in revenues of $1.2 million. So you yeah. was overspent so, $430,000 that you took out of a, a, so, a surplus fund. So, here's, so that's, that's reduced so, spending? So, so here's the funny thing. Here's the funny thing. The townships aren't allowed to have savings accounts. We had at one point fifteen million dollars. We have like one point five million dollar budget. We have a ten. We have a savings account ten times our uh, uh, our annual budget. And so the budget commission uh, was on our case, and we ended up built, building a fire department. Is what we essentially did when I was there. But they were on our case to spend the money. You can't keep this money. You got to. You, you, you got to. You got to either give it back to the taxpayers, which I actually favored. Or you got to spend the money, and as I said, we did spend on the fire department. And who do you think was on the uh, the budget commission at that time, forcing Bainbridge Township to spend their savings account money? Dave Joyce. And guess who's Dave lying? Joyce on the budget commission and guess telling who's lying, us that because you could have gave a tax refund, but you didn't. You oh, spent I, it on your part. I, you tore down schools. I, you put up other things. You spent money like a drunken sailor. I, and now all I, of a sudden, I everybody favored, else is wrong. I favored the refund, but my you know township trustee is only one out of three. Oh yeah. But we mm -hmm. we never you never moved every never year. had any deficit spending because we had Absolutely so much wrong. money in our every single year. You did. All right. I want to move on to another issue. Sure. Uh, and that is that. Uh, you know, you say on your, your sheet, um, not much that you, your philosophy is Christian, conservative. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. That order. I mean, if, if, if you believe that, how can you represent a diverse district? Uh, if, if it's sort of your, your Christianity well, is first in, in sure, order. Sure, sure. Well, well Judeo-Christian values are what this country was built upon. There's no doubt about it. You know, I have a copy of the Constitution here, and, and, and you can read quote after quote after quote about our founding fathers and how the, the liberty and, and the, the sanctity of, of, of the individual was based upon uh, their biblical values. So, the, so Judeo-Christian values are not contrary to Christian values or any other values. And I welcome, you know, it's not a question of faith. It's a question of values. So if someone's Jewish or Muslim or Hindu or whatever they want to be, and they share those same values, then great, uh, because they'll be consistent with what I support as well. Okay. Um, I've heard that um, some on the uh, Democratic side are, are rooting for you to win <laughs> Matt Lynch, because this is a, a district that's fairly, uh, you know, one of the more competitive in, in the state, still leans Republican. Yes. But that, uh, the view being that, that you're so far to the right mm -hmm. that it almost guarantees that a centrist Democrat will be able to get through the door. Well, if you can find a centrist Democrat, you might. Okay. <laughs> but, okay. but the, this district's been Republican for over 20 years, uh, and particularly this year, it's it's not going to go anywhere other than Republican, in my opinion. Um, however. I do think that it's important for the people of the 14th district to have a choice, to have a choice between the, the leftist leaning policies of Obama and Clinton or whomever, uh, and the conservative values that are on display now in the presidential race in, in, the, in the Republican Party. Uh, and that's a clear choice. And that's part of the problem. You know, uh, you know, Dave ran ads last time against his opponents, you know, complaining he had a big house, uh, you know, and he's living like a king, and he, he's got an ad running right now, you know, showing me driving a fancy car. You know, he runs these really foolish kinds of campaigns. And that's what, I mean, that's old time politics. That's, that's what you do. You take the big lobbyist money and you just sort of try to smear the other candidate. You avoid policies. You know, we have 14 town halls in the district, 14. And Congressman Joyce was invited to every single one and he never showed up once. In fact, this is probably the only time during this entire campaign where we'll be in the same room taking questions because he's been hiding under his desk in Washington for the last seven months while I've been campaigning. So this is the reality, that he doesn't want to have the debate of values because frankly, if he does, he loses dramatically. Have you been judging those debates? No, that's pretty funny that he brings that up. You know, these publicity stunts that he puts on, you know, he's the one with his gaudy buttons and drives around in an ambulance with the signs on it. You know, you'll never see me doing any of that stuff. You know, I tell people when I first got into office, look, I'm going to tell you the truth. Good, better, and different, I'll tell you the truth. You can all deal with the truth. And, it, you know, obviously it worked pretty well for me last time, and it worked pretty well for me in the Democratic primary, and I've never put out ads with somebody's house. Yeah, I put out ads with him with his, you know, because the other car, he's got his Jaguar, you know, and it, it's got a Jaguar vanity plate in case you didn't know it was a Jaguar. And, and talk about the money that he's misspent when he was a trustee and all that. But, this, is how, but, but this is what's important to him. But, but, my, my, my license plate is important to him. 
No, it just shows that it's, uh, the vanity. Yeah, it shows something, all right. It shows yeah. something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and your pretty picture on every one of your sides, that's, that's a good look, too. But, you know, the other part about it that is just sort of galling to me is he has these alleged uh, debates. And I've had people come up to me saying, hey, I went to these things because he's putting out banners unbeknownst to us. And then he invites, it says in the bottom in small letters, invited guests. And he uh, sends them over on a fax machine after our office is closed. So I have no idea. Or I'm in D.C. So, yes, I'm not under my desk. I'm right sitting at my desk or I'm sitting in uh, where I'm supposed to be making sure I'm taking care of business for the people of the 14th District. And so I don't, I don't go to these publicity stunts. You know, I've heard his, his, uh, what he's been saying. He's been running against me for three years. He's been lying against me for three years. And he talks about smears. The only smears I know is Sherry Miller. That woman got smeared. But otherwise, when you bring up the man's record, you can go right into the fact that what his record says, that he overspent when he was a trustee, that he voted against a balanced budget when he was a state rep, that he has never gotten anything accomplished worthwhile, and now all of a sudden he wants to be a congressman. So here he has 14 town halls. We fax him to his office, we send him registered mail letters, we send him emails, inviting him to every single one. Uh, if, when you call a town hall a publicity stunt, I mean, really, there were people there every time asking, is Congressman Joyce coming? And every time we'd say, we hope so. Looking at, at your positions, you mm -hmm. actually seem to be more alike than different, right? You both uh, seem to have a very similar position on uh, guns, on you know, refugees on Guantanamo. Uh, what what would you say, uh, Matt Lynch, are the key issue differences? Well, I think the, the this is again part of the problem. It's one thing to say this is what you believe in. It's another thing to actually vote and fight for it. When I was in the Ohio legislature, you know, I voted to take driver's licenses away from, I sponsored the bill to take driver's licenses away from illegals in the state of Ohio. I, I sponsored the bill to uh, eliminate discount tuition for illegals in the state of Ohio. I fought for the workers of the state of Ohio. Uh, I didn't just say I was for something, I fought for the heartbeat bill. So, th so these are all things that, uh, again, have to be actually acted upon. Dave can say he's always worried about the the, the ISIS or Syrian refugees, but when you vote for the omnibus bill that funds the, the resettlement of refugees in the United States, you know, that's not consistent. And that's the problem. It isn't, isn't what Dave says. He says he's a conservative. Just the reality is he's not. But if you were in that position, just to clarify, you would not vote for a budget simply because it contained one thing that you disagreed with. Well, first of all, I wouldn't vote for any budget that was expanding the deficit, you know, okay. and so, so that, that's part of the problem. And, and growing the debt, we have $20 trillion in debt pretty soon, so we've got to get that under control. But um, I, I would be, I would use the ultimate authority, the greatest power that Congress has, which is the power of the purse, uh, and not you know, these, these, these congressmen that are afraid, to, oh, I'm going to shut the government down. You know, Ronald Reagan shut the government down eight times, eight times, including just a few weeks before his avalanche reelection. The idea that you, that you can't use the power of the purse to control spending is, is just, it's just cowardice is all it is, and it's not true. The, the fact is, if you have people in front of the cameras and in the leadership that articulate the conservative values that explain to the American people that we cannot live with $20 trillion in debt. You know, if we go to 5% interest on $20 trillion worth of debt, that's a trillion dollars worth of interest each year. There won't be any room left over for anything, for Lake Erie or anything else, okay, if we don't get but, that under control. But just to clarify, it, should a budget bill meet your other criteria on budget issues, would you vote against it if it contained a provision with which you do not agree? Well, obviously, we depend upon the provision. I mean, it, it, it depends okay. on how serious the provision is. I would say to any provision, because okay. so you know, we, the, the last budget bill, at, the last budget bill was thousands of pages okay. long, right? So, so you have to look. But I will tell you this: the, the omnibus bill was opposed by the entire Freedom Caucus, uh, by many others who were outside of the Freedom, Freedom Caucus. There were, there were, I think, over 100 Republicans that voted against it. The omnibus bill was a terrible bill, and and most conservatives, all the conservatives, and many even moderates voted against it. But Dave Joyce voted for it. Well, that just goes to show you how little Matt really knows about governing. The omnibus bill contained uh, a large portion, $529 billion, towards uh, our military and making sure that we have the wherewithal to defend our country and from within and on the outside. Of that, you have uh, roughly uh, $1.3 uh, <clears throat> uh, million that went to, or I mean, excuse me, billion that went to our armed services. Uh, we have $1.3 million. Uh, or 129 billion, and 1.3 million uh, people uh, in uh, actually in duty, 800,000 reservists, and we managed to give them all you know a 
big 1.3% uh, raise, God bless them. These are people who are putting their lives on the line on the front line day in, day out to make sure our country's safe. Moreover, it, it allows $300 million to allow for the uh, substandard housing allowance that we've been giving our military. And that's just been a terrible thing. These people are, are fighting. You know, it, what really got honed it down for me, I gotta tell you, is one of these guys got up, uh, a new freshman, an old guy like me, but we're allegedly freshmen, who said he was overseas. And you know, you guys thought it was a real good idea to shut down the government. You know, I gotta worry about what's in front of me, and I gotta worry about whether my kids' bills are paid, my wife can make the mortgage, whether my wife can make a car payment. You think you're so tough, you're not all that tough. And you know, that, was, that really had a, a profound impact on me, and you're, you're, you're damn right where you, I voted for it, because I wanna make sure that our military has the wherewithal they can do what they're supposed to do, and that these people who are brave enough to put their life on the line, national defense is our number one concern, and I was out there for it. It also, I mean, it goes back to his Syrian refugees, that's just completely wrong. If you don't fund the Border Patrol, you don't have anybody making sure that Syrian refugees are going to be, uh, you know, we're going to be able to protect our borders and make sure that they're not coming in as Trojan horses. So I, I voted for the Syrian refugee the, the, to make sure that we take the time to figure out who they are, because that's a huge problem. I mean, when we had uh, in classified briefings with uh, the FBI Director Comey and, and Secretary Johnson from Homeland Security, they said, you know, when we were in Iraq, you're embedded with these people. You knew who was helpful to you. With Syrian people, this is all new. These are the people coming over. It's not like you have a, a criminal or a database that you can run these people on. So it's two years plus before you ever get there. And, and, and we want to make sure, and, and I want to work with them to make sure they had the resources to make sure that we don't have that what's happening in Europe happen to the Americans. And we just can't let it happen. We can't have them over in, on this continent. We certainly can't have them inside of our country. So did I vote for it? Yes, I did. I voted for it, and I'd vote for it again because that's how you do business. That's how you govern. And it, granted, we, we, you know, it, it really calls out for why we need a conservative president because with a conservative president, we can get so much more done in the House and the Senate and be able to start what we need to do to cut back on some of the spending that uh, and, and, and get our house in order. Um, who are you supporting for president? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm a, a, a loyal Buckeye. I, I think John Kasich's done a wonderful job for the state of Ohio, and, and uh, certainly, I think, as I said before, that <clears throat> there's a, there's a angst out there that the voters understand because they, they hear we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we're going to go here, and it's you know why lie to people? You, know, I, you have to tell them the truth that these are the, here's what we can do. And, and like him or not, uh, you know, let's face it, John Kasich isn't the kind of guy who likes shaking hands and kissing babies, but he, he's done a nice job when he was in Congress and he's done a nice job at the state of Ohio. And I think he, uh, what he needed was the debate he had the other night about two months ago, where he could see here's a man of substance and issues. And then, uh, you know, the, the voters, uh, whoever the, the nominee of our party is, and you know, certainly, uh, you know, I'll be uh, going with, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure who that's going to be at this point. But I do think John Kasich would be effective. Are you uh, so, supporting? Who are you supporting? Well, let me let me just just say first regarding the omnibus bill because you know, truth really is important. And and Dave has trotted out this nonsense about he voted for the omnibus bill because he just you know had to make sure the military got paid. You know it's just phony. Um, the, bo both in the House and the Senate, the the every time any budget battle comes up, they pass what's called the Pay the Military Act. And that's the, the latest House version last September, before the, the, the vote in December, in order to make sure the military gets paid and that Homeland Security is funded and the Defense Department is funded. Th this idea that, oh, I had to vote for this horrible bill because, you know, we had to take care of our men and women in the military, it's just not true. And he knows it's not true. But it's a way to deflect and evade and actually manipulate the public into, into something that's, that's just false. And the idea that voting for this bill uh, somehow it gets to vet the Syrian refugees, my goodness. Uh, it, so we're going to rely upon the Obama administration uh, and, and their people who, who've frankly created a big part of this problem to actually be the ones to, to vet the Syrian refugees come in and then spend over $100 million uh, to actually uh, settle them in this country? No, uh, that, that's not what we're going to do. Let's see, certainly not what I would have voted for. I never would have voted for the omnibus bill. And if, if and hey, I'm all for the military. And there could have been a lot of solutions. There could have been a separate bill for the military. There could have been a CR. There, there could have been a better budget bill. You know. uh, but in any case, the safety net always was the Pay the Military Act. And, and Matt, could, you wait, could I ask him one question? Matt, who, who sponsored that bill? Do you know? 
Well, I, actually, I, I could look at it, but no, it's not, no, no, I think no. it's on there. I'll tell you, sponsor. My yeah. good friend Mike Kaufman, who's sure. a veteran, you know where it sits right now? Yeah. In committee. Never once sure. had a hearing. Well, of never course. Never once been brought out full committee. Yeah. So when you track these things out, it shows you how little you know about governance. See, that bill does not exist. Again, see, again, this is this is so false. Because That's so false here, about here, that. Here's what's happened every time there's been a budget fight. A similar bill, they're always called the Pay the Military Act. There was one in 2015. There's one in 2014. Every time there's a budget fight. And early in the process, both in the House and the Senate, a Pay the Military Act bill is, is put in the hopper, you want to say, put in the, so that if the budget fight comes down to shutting down the government, which is what we talked about a little bit, then the bill gets passed. And Obama's even said publicly, said in the New York Times, he, he signed it, he said no problem paying the military. So, so this, this idea that, oh, it's stuck in committee, it's not stuck in committee, it was never came out of committee, because he, of committee. Passed, <laughs> because he passed the omnibus bill. They didn't have to do this. I mean, see, but did you see the kind of manipulation here? It's, it's really incredible. Uh, I, know. I think we're seeing your manipulation because so, that's what so you're saying is just not true. I actually am not endorsing anybody for president. Oh, well, yeah, she's um, endorsed Ted Cruz. Well, oh, I've never endorsed Ted Cruz. Oh, but, yeah, you've been on numerous radio shows. <laughs> well, Ted Cruz. I, I like Ted Cruz. Taking a bat I like Ted Cruz, but I've never endorsed anybody. Oh. And and I, I. So Reverend Cruz coming to your events wasn't part of it? Oh, yeah, I, I like Raphael Cruz too. He stayed at my house for two days. He's a great guy. But I've not endorsed Ted Cruz. I've not endorsed uh, Donald Trump or John Kasich or is there somebody else left in there? <laughs> um, but it's clear that John Kasich's not going to be our nominee. But you know, if you're in Ohio, uh, you have to do what the party leadership tells you. So that's why Dave Joyce endorses right. John Kasich. Um, in your um, yeah. papers that, that you you gave us about your position, you said that you want to cut federal. Uh, judges' salaries by one third. Yeah, and I you would. Want Congress to rein in the um, Supreme Court. Yeah, Article Three of the Constitution uh, gives the Congress juris control over the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. That's right. I mean, that's a, a fairly radical uh, position to take, particularly since sure. uh, you know federal judges probably don't make nearly as much as they would make in the private sector. Uh, I mean, yeah, would, the public service would, is what it's called. <laughs> you would decimate the federal judiciary. And what about the separation of uh, you know, the, the three you know, branches of government. Branches right. of right. government. If you're so, going to essentially uh, pass laws that pertain only to the Supreme Court. Well, okay, so the, so this is what the Constitution says, right? So we're not talking about an abuse of them. We're talking about Article Three of the Constitution that says that the, the U.S. Congress has this kind of authority over the, the, all the federal courts, actually. In fact, the only court created in the Constitution is the Supreme Court. All the federal courts are creations of Congress. And so they have absolute authority to do this. There's no uh, violation of, of uh, authorities between the, the branches of government. But here we are. And, and let me tell you what, how I see this in the broad picture. We have a Congress, what I call the Cowardly Congress, which has decided that it would sit back and for political purposes just not do anything, as you pointed out earlier. You know, they do this teeter-totter back and forth, but we won't get anything accomplished. And what happens? Well, the executive branch steps up and begins to assert its authority beyond the bounds of the Constitution because, frankly, the Congress is letting them get away with it time and time again. And, I th and then you see the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court sits back and says, well, gee, we have this executive expanding its authority. We have Congress not even util utilizing its authority, and I think the, the Supreme Court then is emboldened to also expand its authority to get into areas that it just shouldn't be involved in, including the redefinition of marriage. So these are areas that, that Congress needs to reassert its authority, and if its authority has to be asserted through, through budgeting matters, including the pay of federal judges, you're darn right I'd use that to, to rein in an out-of-control judiciary. What, what, what do you think about that? Uh, Chris, I go back to uh, my undergrad majors accounting. I used to be pretty good at math. You have 246 Republicans. Uh, the group he says he's going to be able to join and in, 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 that is uh, made up of 40 or 38. <clears throat> when they vote in lockstep because they all decide that's what they're going to vote, that takes us down below the 218. So you know, if you say people are, are angry about gridlock, well, this is what creates gridlock. So you could say you're going to do all these things with the Supreme Court. You're never going to muster the votes to do that. You're never going to have any Democrats. And, and uh, that you lose respect and you lose, uh, you know, I, I always looked at this as a seat in which you represented the people of the 14th district with honor and distinction. We've had some great leaders here before, Mr. Stanton, and Congressman LaTourette before, Dennis Eckert. 
And, and, and they did things by going out there and being truthful with their people in the district and being truthful with the people in Washington, building respect, and that's how you get things done. You don't go on there and you, know, you want to go in front of the TV every night and, and you know, like the, uh, I've seen uh, Sabrina covering the Freedom Caucus as a conservative hour where they sit there and, uh, and she said it's good for laughs and free pizza because they put out food for them. But you know, and they all sit up there and pound their chest on how, they're con how conservative they're going to be. You know, but again, I told people I was going to tell them the truth. And when it came to the omnibus vote, well, there was 238 uh, yeas up on the board before it got to me. I could have voted no and come back here and, and, and you know, just, yeah, I'm a conservative. But I told people, I'm like, it starts with me in the mirror. I have to look myself in the mirror. I can't vote against that military. I can't vote against the visa uh, border protection programs. You know, I got to make sure that we have the intelligence ready to, to take our, the many faceted attacks we have in our country, in this world. You have to be able to deal with those. And so in order to tell the people at home you're part of it, then I have to be truthful to them. All right, speaking of looking yourself in the mirror, Following up on Betsy's question, you saw last Thursday night a candidate for the President of the United States discussing basically his genitalia on national TV. When, when actually youth are watching this process, mm -hmm. turning that debate into an R-rated debate, and yet yeah. you say, you just said, and you, you, you didn't say it specifically, but I'd like to hear whether you would say it, you'll support the ultimate candidate. So, so you're okay with a candidate for the President of the United States going on national TV and doing things like that. Yeah. You, no, said, no, you yeah. said you would ultimately support whoever the candidate is. Yeah, he I, could be that candidate. I hear you, Chris. And, and no, I thought that was, but for John Kasich's performance, was a horrible debate. You know, we, actually, that's, we have so many serious problems facing our world. You know, that's what we're going to talk about. And, and all the candidates' behavior, but for John's, has been uh, childish you know, with what we've got going forward. Now, the only part that I got out of uh, Donald Trump's back talk was you know, talking about having to make deals and that you have to work with people to make deals. So you can go and say, I'm standing for this and I'm standing for that and I'm going to do because you know, 3% or 5% or whatever the district says, I told them and I'm going to stand up for this. Thing. What about the other 95% of the district that cares about making sure this country works? What about those people who need to, haven't seen their, uh, their finances decimated after 2008? Or have, have not got a wage increase and have not had. What about those people? You he, have to represent them too. But if he's the candidate, which you know he's the front runner now, maybe he won't be. But if he's the candidate, you said you'll stand behind him. So you would put the full faith and credit of the name of Dave Joyce behind Donald Trump with all of the antics that he's had. That's what you just said. And I'm I, 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 I hear you, and I did how say. Do you, how do you? You know, I mean, could you have gone out on the road Friday and defended him in that debate? No. You know, I'm, like I said, I'm a Buckeye, and so I, I'm still behind John Kasich, and, you know, I'm also a Cleveland sports fan, so you know, it, I think that someday we're going to win a championship, too. But, you know, I, I like to think that somehow we could, you know, John is going to be able to pull this off. And, you know, now he's coming back home into Michigan and in the Midwest and in Ohio, and, and I hope that he could start to rack up the delegates he needs to get to where he has to go because he's done an effective job, and he showed it. He was a proven leader when he was on that stage. I hear what you're saying. I would like to think that this, if Donald Trump does get it, the vice presidential pick will probably be the most important pick in history because you need somebody like John Kasich who understands how government works. Because when you have somebody out there talking nonsense and blathering to the, that they are uh, building a wall and you know, stamp it to, to put T's in it and, and it's going to be 10 feet higher and it's going to make the Mexican government pay, that sounds good. But, you know, is it realistic, Chris? You know, I, I that's where I stand. So, yeah, so I'm going to support the nominee, uh, unquestionably. Uh, but last week was pretty embarrassing. Uh, what you point out is actually horrible, and, and I've uh, referred to it as more like a food fight. You know, it just wasn't wasn't an adult conversation. And uh, you could see what happened, though. I mean, Donald Trump is bombastic to say the least, right? So he's he's uh, um, attacked and sort of sort of you know ratcheted up the language from Marco Rubio, who was trying to save his his candidacy, and the media just loves it. I mean, I, I, you know, you sort of get out of the candidates what you, what you put into them. You know, when they have moderators that entice them into that kind of a food fight uh, scenario, yeah, this is what you get, and it's horrible. I, you know, I don't, and I frankly don't understand. I, I actually blame Rince Priebus, because here, these are Republican debates for the Republican nominee. It's not the CNN debate. It's not the Fox debate. It's the Republican debate. 
and for the Republican Party leadership to turn it over to people whose only goal is to have high ratings. Food fights are good for high ratings, right? There's the problem. You want to have a higher level of, of discussion at those debates, then you get those four people around the table with a moderator who reads a card to them and puts it aside and doesn't say another word and let them have the discussion. But the kind of debates we're having, it, it's all about how can we get higher ratings for, for Fox News or whomever. Uh, and, and so I, I and, and you know, look, I've been in debate situations many times. You say things you really wish you shouldn't had, had said, and Donald Trump had probably a few of those moments he's, he's thinking about. But uh, in the end, what I'm concerned about is how we're going to get uh, conservative governance to, to save this country so that we do build the wall, so that we do have higher wages by getting rid of illegal labor in this country, so that we do control the debt. And uh, I'm hopeful that Donald Trump, when he talks about those issues, is serious and going and to fight for those. Certainly Ted Cruz uh, talks about it. Even Marco Rubio talks about it. So, um, so I'm hopeful that we're going to have a candidate that will focus on those issues and not focus, focus on the food fight. I wanted to bring up the issue of guns. Um, sure. We've spoken to your likely Democratic uh, opponent um, in November, and it's an issue that he feels strongly about. Um, Congressman Joyce has been critical editorially of, of you on this issue as a prosecutor, former prosecutor, and having the Chardon school shootings mm -hmm. in your district. Uh, why you are taking such a hard line about guns not even to uh, entertain the idea of that some reforms are well, no, well the, the point I brought up on a number of occasions, uh, Elizabeth, is, and I even reached out to the vice president when after they had the uh, shooting in Connecticut to say, look, uh, I had the unfortunate happenstance to actually investigate these things and go through since Columbine. How did we get here? And the underlying current throughout Attacks, whether it's at school or in Aurora, Colorado, or these other ones, is mental health. And we have to find a way to uh, you know, break down the connection uh, to a degree with HIPAA and allow mental health records that are being gathered by uh, either law enforcement or in domestic relations cases or other things where there's already a history, a documented history of somebody having mental illness, somehow incorporate those into the process so that you have a, a look at the a total view of the person standing in front of you when you're going to purchase this weapon. And, and you know, it, it, again, it's not the weapon holder. It's just like, you know, uh, the car doesn't go out and kill somebody. It's a drunk driver operating the car, and it's the, the gun doesn't kill anybody. It's the person with the mental health issues who ends up getting the gun. And when you look at Connecticut, that kid executed his own mother. So obviously, and she was afraid of him, and there was a mental health issue. And she should be able to tell somebody, look, my son's not firing on all six cylinders. I need some help here without having to worry about, in courts, you know, probate court would need to get more involved to make sure that we take care of that person and, and do what's necessary to make sure that these people aren't running around and getting the guns, because they'll get the gun somewhere. I mean, it, it's like a currency on the streets with drug dealers. You'll find guns that are out there. And you know, we had a number of different occasions where the uh, people were ramming their cars into stores in, in Jaga County and stealing the guns, and they'd end up down here in the streets. I mean, that, that sort of stuff happens. I'm trying to say the Second Amendment for legal, for, for you know, homeowners and, and the people who want to have these weapons should have the opportunity to purchase weapons and sell weapons and do what they want to, but also have a meaningful dialogue about how we can do the things that are necessary to make sure we can stop or at least certainly impede the, the growth of these type of uh, shootings throughout the country. Um, Matt Lynch, what's your position? Yes, thanks. Well, I, I think as you point out, we're very much in agreement on this, at least. I was actually the uh, sponsor of a bill in the state legislature. I, I co-sponsored and voted for every uh, bill to expand uh, gun rights in Ohio. The, uh, the idea that, that we're, we're reducing the number of guns sold or changing the way they're sold would affect uh, these kinds of tragedies is just not borne out by the facts, as the congressman says. These are primarily people with mental illness. That, I mean, frankly, the, the, some of the cities like Chicago, they have the toughest gun laws have the greatest murder rates, you know. So it's 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 not a question of the legality of the gun for the for the uh, citizen who's a uh, who is a law-abiding citizen. It's a, it's a it's a question of controlling the criminal and how they get a hold of guns when they shouldn't have guns. So um, so the Second Amendment has to be defended. I think the greatest risk of the Second Amendment is actually the courts, as we know with the, the death of Judge Scalia, Justice Scalia. We're we're now in a situation where if we have the wrong Supreme Court justice appointed, presumably next year. 
uh, that we're going to we're going to have a potential loss of our Second Amendment rights. And this is one reason why we need a Republican in the White House, and we need people in Congress and in the Senate uh, that will will appoint a Chief Justice who will defend those rights. And if necessary, one reason why Congress, that is the, the U.S. Congress as opposed to the Senate, has to uh, use its authority over the Supreme Court uh, if they should go uh, awry on this issue. And I might finally add this. There's been a lot of talk about an Article 5 convention um, in, the, in the United States to actually uh, try to reinforce some of the Bill of Rights now. And one of those proposed amendments has to do with the ability of the states to override a Supreme Court decision. And I actually agree with this. Essentially, it, it provides that if a Supreme Court decision is overridden by two-thirds of the state legislatures within 24 months of it being decided, uh, that that decision will be null and void. Uh, that's an important uh, new kind of enforcement for federalism in the United States. You know, the, 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 US, the state legislatures used to control the U.S. Senate, right? We used to have the, the, the ability to appoint senators and control those senators. Now they're pretty much on their own. Uh, so this would be an important thing to do and an important way to defend Second Amendment rights. Don't you think that that is actually a in combination with your earlier suggestion that Congress should pass laws to uh, restrict the Supreme Court from ruling in certain cases, uh, a rather dangerous um, intrusion on the ability of the courts to play a role independent, uh, the Supreme Court that is, independent of politics <coughs> in assessing whether laws meet constitutional Bars. Muster, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, read the Federalist Papers. You, you know that the Founding Fathers all thought that the courts would, in the Supreme Court would be the weakest branch of the three branches of government. It was never intended that, uh, as Congressman mentioned earlier, that somehow it's fought out between the executive and, and the Congress, and then the Supreme Court is the ultimate authority, which is where we are today in the 21st century. It was never intended to be that way. Supreme Court's role was only, only to look at the document before them. This is, of course, the the wonderful part of Judge Scalia, he, he was an originalist. He believed that the Constitution stood for what it said, not for what somebody believed at the time. It's not a living, breathing document. It's a document that states clearly the limitations on federal authority. And when the U.S., uh, when the Supreme Court expands that federal authority by its own pen, we're being ruled by an oligarchy of justices rather than by uh, the, the constitutional republic we were intended. And so, no, I, re I reject the idea that, that it limits the Supreme Court. It only limits the Supreme Court to its actual constitutional authority as opposed to its expanded authority that it uh, uses today. Well, time to wrap up. Uh, we appreciate it. You've uh, given us a good sense of differences and uh, likenesses um, between the two of you. Uh, Nothing new, I suspect. <laughs> uh, Representative Lynch, since we start with you, we'll, we'll let you, uh, or started with, you went second in your <laughs> Okay, I get we'll it. Start with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. So uh, this is my second run uh, against Congressman Joyce for Congress. He was appointed to the U.S. Congress, as you know, originally uh, when Steve Latourette stepped down. Uh, and and uh, I ran against him at the time, in great part because I was concerned that he had already displayed this attitude to just go along with the party bosses. Um, here we are now, almost two years later, and that record is just crystal clear. Uh, every conservative organization in the country uh, gives him an F as a conservative, but he he continues to say, "Oh, I'm I'm a conservative. I'm just the same Jaga County conservative I always have been," which is actually another way, way of saying you're a liberal. So I, I reject that, uh, and um, you know he he is uh, he's written letters actually criticizing all of these or, or these conservative groups, saying that they don't know what they're talking about, and it reminds me of the the grandmother that sees her son in the marching band, and and they go by, and her son's out of step, and she says, well look at that, my son's the only one that's got it right. No, Congressman Joyce does not have it right. He is from the old school of politics that takes the big money from lobbyists and then does what the party tells them, uh, to push the green button or the red button according to what they want. And when Matt Lynch goes to Congress, he will be his own man, only beholding to the people of the 14th District uh, to fight for the conservative values that, frankly, they are screaming for. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for the opportunity to come here today. And uh, let, let, let's, let's uh, start uh, by discussing some of those things that he just said. 
Uh, first off, I think he's already told you today that he's going to join the Freedom Caucus, and the Freedom Caucus of the 38 members. And so, uh, again, they have a, a rule that if you don't vote whatever 80% of them vote, then you get thrown out of the caucus. So obviously he's already given his voting card to the Freedom Caucus. But he starts talking about all these different organizations. Conservative Review is one that he always likes. Well, Conservative Review, uh, the, the thing that annoys me about that, my, my voting record's an open public record. I mean, you know, every day we put it out there. We tell you what we voted for, what we didn't vote for, and uh, try to give a substance as to why. <clears throat> but, you know, they take uh, nine different bills when it comes to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, all of them, I voted for everyone to defund, delay, or, or uh, take away the Affordable Care Act. Uh, they take nine of them, and they only pick one. Uh, 705 votes, you know, they, 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 maybe a dozen that they use and to, to come up with these scorecards. So uh, I'm not surprised that I, I, I got bad grades on them. I mean, you can cherry pick the votes I take, you're going to get the grade that you want out of it. But you know, the, the other important part about this is that when you talk about I'm in somebody's pocket or I'm in, uh, that is absolutely not true. I mean, uh, did the, the U.S. Chamber uh, support me? Yeah, they support me because you know, I'm trying to do things that are right for our economy, Northeastern Ohio, a very fragile economy, but to make sure that we continue to grow, to make sure that Northeastern Ohio still is the greatest location in the nation. And so I work in concert with uh, my fellow members and, and from my place on the Appropriations Committee to try to get our country back on, on budget. And, and the Freedom Caucus is right now working hard to make sure that we don't pass a budget. The budget was agreed to. The numbers, the top line numbers were agreed to. The appropriation process, as you all know, is how we tie funding and make sure that the government spends the money according to the way the people see fit. So when we pass our 12 appropriation bills and the Senate passes their 12 appropriation bills, they go into a process, a conference, if you will, where I, for lack of a better an, an, an analogy, they uh, smooth off the, the rough edges and, and then create the final bill that is passed and goes to the president for signature. We haven't done that. That's how you control spending. So to say that you're just going to go vote no on things and, and talk about CRs, CRs is just handing a blank check to the president to continue to spend the money the way he sees fit, which has gotten us into this regulatory uh, mayhem, which has gotten us all the oversight that no one wants or deserves, that's gotten us in a position where it just doesn't work. That's where governance broke down. And when you continue to tell people that you're going to go and do this and that and tell the Supreme Court how to rule, you know, that's great if you want to be a new radio show host or the other things that you've done and you aspire to be, but it doesn't do anything for the American people who are counting on us to get the job done. So I told the people when I got there I was going to tell them the truth. I'm to, I tell them, tell them the truth as we move forward. And I think one of my biggest jobs at this moment is obviously to make sure that our nation is safe, that our nation is secure. And I voted for the omnibus for those reasons because I want to make sure that we have what we need and, uh, to make sure that our country stays safe. The economy and other things fall in line, but if our country's not safe, if we have problems at home, then or we're getting attacked from uh, outside or within, then, then we have much bigger issues. So I, I focus on the things that we can make a difference on, and then I work towards making sure that we can get to our ultimate goal, which is to reduce our spending, reduce the deficit, and make sure that our government works for everyone. Thank you.